Section 6, Establishment in Canaan. Chapter 44, Crossing the Jordan. This chapter is based on Joshua 1 and chapter 5, verse 12. The Israelites deeply mourned for their departed leader, and thirty days were devoted to special services in honor of his memory. Never till he was taken from them had they so fully realized the value of his wise counsels, his parental tenderness, and his unswerving faith. With a new and deeper appreciation, they recalled the precious lessons he had given while still with them. Moses was dead, but his influence did not die with him. It was to live on, reproducing itself in the hearts of his people. The memory of that holy, unselfish life would long be cherished, with silent, persuasive power molding the lives even of those who had neglected his living words. As the glow of the descending sun lights up the mountain peaks long after the sun itself has sunk behind the hills, so the works of the pure, the holy, and the good shed light upon the world long after the actors themselves have passed away. Their works, their words, their example will forever live. The righteous shall be in everlasting remembrance. Psalm 112, verse 6. While they were filled with grief at their great loss, the people knew that they were not left alone. The pillar of cloud rested over the tabernacle by day and the pillar of fire by night, an assurance that God would still be their guide and helper if they would walk in the way of his commandments. Joshua was now the acknowledged leader of Israel. He had been known chiefly as a warrior, and his gifts and virtues were especially valuable at this stage in the history of his people. Courageous, resolute, and persevering, prompt, incorruptible, unmindful of selfish interests in his care for those committed to his charge, and, above all, inspired by a living faith in God. Such was the character of the man divinely chosen to conduct the armies of Israel in their entrance upon the promised land. During the sojourn in the wilderness, he had acted as a prime minister to Moses, and by his quiet, unpretending fidelity, his steadfastness when others wavered, his firmness to maintain the truth in the midst of danger, he had given evidence of his fitness to succeed Moses, even before he was called to the position by the voice of God. It was with great anxiety and self-distrust that Joshua had looked forward to the work before him. But his fears were removed by the assurance of God, As I was with Moses, so I will be with thee. I will not fail thee, nor forsake thee. Unto this people shalt thou divide for an inheritance the land, which I swear unto their fathers to give them. Every place that the sole of your foot shall tread upon, that have I given unto you, as I said unto Moses. To the heights of Lebanon in the far distance, to the shores of the great sea, and away to the banks of the Euphrates in the east, all was to be theirs. To this promise was added the injunction, Only be thou strong and very courageous, that thou mayest observe to do according to all the law which Moses my servant commanded. The Lord's direction was, This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night. Turn not from it to the right hand or to the left, for then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and then thou shalt have good success. The Israelites were still encamped on the east side of Jordan, which presented the first barrier to the occupation of Canaan. Arise had been the first message of God to Joshua. Go over this Jordan, thou and all this people, unto the land which I do give to them. No instruction was given as to the way in which they were to make the passage. Joshua knew, however, that whatever God should command, he would make a way for his people to perform. And in this faith, the intrepid leader at once began his arrangements for an advance. A few miles beyond the river, just opposite the place where the Israelites were encamped, 
was the large and strongly fortified city of Jericho. This city was virtually the key to the whole country, and it would present a formidable obstacle to the success of Israel. Joshua therefore sent two young men as spies to visit this city and to ascertain something as to its population, its resources, and the strength of its fortifications. The inhabitants of the city, terrified and suspicious, were constantly on the alert and the messengers were in great danger. They were, however, preserved by Rahab, a woman of Jericho, at the peril of her own life. In return for her kindness, they gave her a promise of protection when the city should be taken. The spies returned in safety with the tidings, Truly the Lord hath delivered into our hands all the land, for even all the inhabitants of the country do faint because of us. It had been declared to them in Jericho, We have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea for you when ye came up out of Egypt, and what ye did unto the two kings of the Amorites that were on the other side Jordan, Zion and Og, whom ye utterly destroyed. And as soon as we had heard these things, our hearts did melt, neither did there remain any more courage in any man because of you. For the Lord your God... He is God in heaven above and in earth beneath. Orders were now issued to make ready for an advance. The people were to prepare a three days supply of food, and the army was to be put in readiness for battle. All heartily acquiesced in the plans of their leader and assured him of their confidence and support. All that thou commandest us we will do, and whithersoever thou sendest us we will go. According as we hearkened unto Moses in all things, so will we hearken unto thee. Only the Lord thy God be with thee as he was with Moses. Leaving their encampment in the acacia groves of Shittim, the host descended to the border of the Jordan. All knew, however, that without divine aid they could not hope to make the passage. At this time of the year, in the spring season, the melting snows of the mountains had so raised the Jordan that the river overflowed its banks, making it impossible to cross at the usual fording places. God willed that the passage of Israel over Jordan should be miraculous. Joshua, by divine direction, commanded the people to sanctify themselves. They must put away their sins and free themselves from all outward impurity. For tomorrow, he said, the Lord will do wonders among you. The Ark of the Covenant was to lead the way before the host. When they should see the token of Jehovah's presence, borne by the priests, remove from its place in the center of the camp and advance toward the river, then they were to remove from their place and go after it. The circumstances of the passage were minutely foretold, and said Joshua, Hereby ye shall know that the living God is among you, and that he will without fail drive out from before you the Canaanites. Behold, the ark of the covenant of the Lord of all the earth passes over before you into Jordan. At the appointed time began the onward movement, the ark borne upon the shoulders of the priests leading the van. The people had been directed to fall back, so that there was a vacant space of more than half a mile about the ark. All watched with deep interest as the priests advanced down the bank of the Jordan. They saw them with the sacred ark move steadily forward toward the angry, surging stream, till the feet of the bearers were dipped into the waters. Then suddenly the tide above was swept back, while the current below flowed on, and the bed of the river was laid bare. At the divine command, the priests advanced to the middle of the channel and stood there while the entire host descended and crossed to the farther side. Thus was impressed upon the minds of all Israel the fact that the power that stayed the waters of Jordan was the same that had opened the Red Sea to their fathers forty years before. When the people had all passed over, the ark itself was borne to the western shore. No sooner had it reached a place of security, and the soles of the priest's feet were lifted up unto the dry ground, than the imprisoned waters being set free rushed down a resistless flood in the natural channel of the stream. 
coming generations were not to be without a witness to this great miracle. While the priests bearing the ark were still in the midst of Jordan, twelve men previously chosen, one from each tribe, took up each a stone from the riverbed where the priests were standing and carried it over to the western side. These stones were to be set up as a monument in the first camping place beyond the river. The people were bidden to repeat to their children and children's children the story of the deliverance that God had wrought for them, as Joshua said, that all the people of the earth might know the hand of the Lord, that it is mighty, that ye might fear the Lord your God forever. The influence of this miracle, both upon the Hebrews and upon their enemies, was of great importance. It was an assurance to Israel of God's continued presence and protection, and evidence that he would work for them through Joshua as he had wrought through Moses. Such an assurance was needed to strengthen their hearts as they entered upon the conquest of the land, the stupendous task that had staggered the faith of their fathers forty years before. The Lord had declared to Joshua before the crossing, this day will I begin to magnify thee in the sight of all Israel, that they may know that, as I was with Moses, so I will be with thee. And the result fulfilled the promise. On that day the Lord magnified Joshua in the sight of all Israel, and they feared him as they feared Moses all the days of his life. This exercise of divine power in behalf of Israel was designed also to increase the fear with which they were regarded by the surrounding nations, and thus prepare the way for their easier and complete triumph. When the tidings that God had stayed the waters of Jordan before the children of Israel reached the kings of the Amorites and of the Canaanites, their hearts melted with fear. The Hebrews had already slain the five kings of Midian, the powerful Sion, king of the Amorites, and Og of Bashan, and now the passage over the swollen and impetuous Jordan filled all the surrounding nations with terror. To the Canaanites, to all Israel, and to Joshua himself, unmistakable evidence had been given that the living God, the King of heaven and earth, was among his people, and that he would not fail them nor forsake them. A short distance from Jordan, the Hebrews made their first encampment in Canaan. Here Joshua circumcised the children of Israel, and the children of Israel encamped in Gilgal and kept the Passover. The suspension of the rite of circumcision since the rebellion at Kadesh had been a constant witness to Israel that their covenant with God, of which it was the appointed symbol, had been broken. And the discontinuance of the Passover, the memorial of their deliverance from Egypt, had been an evidence of the Lord's displeasure at their desire to return to the land of bondage. Now, however, the years of rejection were ended. Once more God acknowledged Israel as his people, and the sign of the covenant was restored. The rite of circumcision was performed upon all the people who had been born in the wilderness. And the Lord declared to Joshua, This day have I rolled away the reproach of Egypt from off you. And in allusion to this, the place of their encampment was called Gilgal, a rolling away or rolling off. Heathen nations had reproached the Lord and his people because the Hebrews had failed to take possession of Canaan, as they expected, soon after leaving Egypt. Their enemies had triumphed because Israel had wandered so long in the wilderness, and they had mockingly declared that the God of the Hebrews was not able to bring them into the promised land. The Lord had now signally manifested his power and favor in opening the Jordan before his people, and their enemies could no longer reproach them. On the fourteenth day of the month at even, the Passover was celebrated on the plains of Jericho, and they did eat of the old corn of the land on the morrow after the Passover, unleavened cakes and parched corn in the selfsame day. And the manna ceased on the morrow, after they had eaten of the old corn of the land. Neither had the children of Israel manna any more, but they did eat of the fruit of the land of Canaan. The long years of their desert wanderings were ended, 
The feet of Israel were at last treading the promised land.